Okay, so last time we talked about the endogenous growth model with human capital investment. We talked about different applications. We looked at a movie. We looked at some stuff from the news. And we kind of talked about ways that, you know, some of those applications might have kind of hit the nail on the head. Others, maybe not quite so much. Probably more in favor of the not quite so much. Um, And then we talked about different ways that the model could be tweaked and different applications that it, that the model presented for more economic research rather than just going like, okay, well, let's criticize what's being said based on what this model suggests, right? Let's think about ways that this can be applied to understand real world phenomena. And the example that I gave was basically differences between black and white education, right? Black and white human capital accumulation in the United States as a result of segregation and Jim Crow laws. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be looking into that model a little bit, and we're going to look at the empirical tests of the model to see if the parameters from that particular model uh, were realistic, whether they actually fit what we see in the real-world data, right? Whether the model-generated data compares well to the real-world data, right? The, the gener- the, like the data-generated data. So we compare those two, and we will sort of analyze the fit of that particular model. Now, it yeah, pretty much goes without saying, uh, African Americans have faced substantial levels of discrimination for a majority of U.S. history. Jim Crow laws enacted between the late 19th and early 20th centuries basically forced like government mandated segregation between whites and blacks in public facilities in mostly southern states. This was fought I mean, there are a number of times that this was fought legally, um, one of which is Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, a Supreme Court decision, upheld segregation conditional that if segregation were to be maintained, it has to be both separate and equal. Now, as we have learned throughout history, um, the former was maintained fairly well. Right, that the separation in some of these states was pretty stark. The latter, on the other hand, uh, seemed to be of no concern to a lot of these policymakers. If we look at state level per pupil expenditures, right, so expenditures at the government level for black students and white students between 1890 and 1960, the average was 67 percent. Right, so black students were allocated an average of 67 percent of funding that white students were allocated. And that's an average, and there's a pretty wide variance there. There are some states that were giving like 20 to 30% to black students of what white students were getting. Now, stop me if I'm wrong here, but that sounds a little screwed up. Doesn't really sound particularly uh, equal to me. Um, So yeah, clearly there's, there's problems here, right? And so of course, you know, Throughout this period from 1890 to 1960, there were, like I said, multiple cases. There were multiple legal battles fought. There was, of course, Brown versus the Board of Education decision, right, that said basically segregation was unconstitutional. Um, Unfortunately, uh, because the Supreme Court really don't have any teeth, um, they're not a legislative body, right? All they can do is rule on whether a law is is, uh, constitutional or unconstitutional. But they have no way of enforcing that, right? It's still kind of up to the legislature and the executive to pass laws to change it and enforce the existing laws that are on the books. So it really wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that finally abolished Jim Crow and segregation in the United States. Now, if we look at log, the the natural logarithm of real expenditures per pupil between 1890 and 1960, you can see that, well, just about everywhere, at every single point in time, the expenditures per pupil for black students was way less than what it was for white students. White students were getting allocated more of that funding than what black students were getting. Kind of not okay. So what I'm going to be doing here is first I'm going to talk about a dynamic dynastic human capital accumulation model where parents choose how much schooling they want to allocate to their children. So there's like an overlapping generations thing. I know we haven't gone over overlapping generations models. Um, I'd really rather just 
sort of stick with like the, the traditional like dynamic general equilibrium stuff, but in a, an overlapping generation model, right? One generation is sort of choosing what's going to happen for the next generation, right? We can use overlapping generations models to analyze like, you know, how social security would work, right? Because as soon as social security came in, right, what was happening was that the current labor force was paying the retired, right? So there wasn't like in you know, this buildup of funds that then got dispersed later, right? So the current working population is actually supporting the retired population when it comes to social security. So that's like another case where you could use an overlapping generations model. But here, instead of looking at social security, we look at how parents want to allocate schooling time to their children. Now, there are human capital spillovers, kind of like what we've seen before that allow for every generation to build upon what the previous generation had. Excuse me. More schooling means that there's more efficient intergenerational human capital spillovers. What do I mean by that? Well, these human capital spillovers spill over across generations. So if one particular birth, that birth cohort, I don't know why I'm having a hard time speaking right now. If one birth cohort gets more schooling, right, more formal education, well, when they grow up and, you know, become nice, good, strong, productive members of society and have lots of babies of their own, right, for their children, there will be human capital spillovers from the parent to the child in a more efficient way, right, because it's not like schooling just happens in the school, right, it's not like you just go to school and that's all the schooling you get, no, you get parents that help you, right, if your parents, let's say, you know, you're in like, what is it, like fourth, fifth grade when they start teaching long division, right? Well, if your parents suck at math, you're probably going to have a really hard time figuring out how to do long division. If your parents are really good at math, on the other hand, right, you're probably not going to struggle as much with long division, right? It's a more efficient intergenerational human capital spillover. Now, when it comes to looking at the model, we don't just want to look at it, right? It's not just like, oh, hey, cool, that's nice. Let's move on. No, we want to look at the model, and then we want to test the model. So how do we test the model? Well, we have to get data to be able to test the model. What kind of data do we get? Well, we get data that was actually really, really, really hard to get. Uh, I spent a good year and a half of my dissertation research just getting data for this particular paper. I had to drive all around all these different states, you know, state archives to access books that really haven't probably been touched since you know, before the turn of the century. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but using this data set that I went out and compiled allows for us to empirically test the model's key educational parameters. The results of the empirical study suggest that African-American students faced much higher costs of schooling than white students did. And this leads to a lower human capital accumulation. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is if African-American students are facing much higher costs of schooling than white students are, well, they're getting less human capital, right? They're accumulating less human capital because it's more costly. The opportunity cost of doing so is much higher for African Americans than it is for white Americans, which means after segregation, right? Once we have desegregated, we've begun integrating the schools, well, there's going to be catching up growth. And it's not catching up growth within that particular generation. It's catching up growth across multiple generations, as we'll be seeing in a little bit. So... Let's talk about the model. Now, the model includes, in the objective function, parents of race R in state I, and they want to maximize this objective function. So this is their utility function. They're probably going like, oh my god, I have to solve that? No, you don't. You don't have to solve it. Because I don't solve it in this paper, right? If I don't solve it, why am I going to make you solve it? It'd be really messed up. Plus, that's there, there's a lot of shit in here. So there are choice variables. Right. What do I mean by choice variables? Well, if you've got utility of consumption, well, that consumption is a choice variable. Okay, so we got consumption in state I of race R, right? So you have consumption in, say, Georgia or South Carolina of white families and black families. It's sort of all aggregated up, <clears throat> right? They can either be white or black, and this time period T is indicating, okay, well, what time period, what year is this? But they don't just choose consumption, they also choose gross fertility. Right? How many children are they going to have? 
Also, what's the living space per child going to be? Are you going to cram eight kids into a like two bedroom house where they all have to share a bedroom? Or are you going to have a slightly larger house where, you know, okay, let's say if you've got eight kids, right, you're probably not going to get a nine bedroom house, but you know, you might get like a four bedroom house or something and split them up a little bit, right? So they get a little bit more living space. They get a little bit more of their own like personal space as they're growing up. Might be kind of nice. Human capital investment. Oh, yeah, we've seen this one already. All right, how much human capital do you want to invest in? Well, that's H sub I R T plus one, right? So if we look at consumption, gross fertility, and living space per child, that's currently, right? That's this period. Human capital investment is next period, right? So we invest in the human capital, but it's for the next generation, right? So parents will choose consumption today, gross fertility today, living space per child today, right? They will still invest in human capital, <clears throat> right? But they're investing not in their human capital, but in their children's human capital, hence the T plus one subscript rather than just a T subscript. Now, beta in this case is not what it's normally treated as, which is that dis like that exponential discounting thing, the discount factor. Here, it's a precautionary demand for children. What do I mean by that? Well, Precautionary demand for children is essentially, well, if things aren't that great and infant mortality rates are kind of high, I want a very high prop, I want a near one probability of being able to further my family line. Well, if the probability of my child dying is kind of high, well, then I'm probably going to want to have more children, right? It's kind of that, it's a really sad way of thinking about it, but it's kind of like that, let's just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Well, if the probability of sticking is rather low, you're going to throw a lot of stuff at the wall. If the probability of something sticking is kind of high, you're not going to throw as much. That's kind of what this is. It's precautionary demand. Now, we have young adult mortality. Okay, well, pro precautionary demand for children and young adult mortality. Okay, yeah, we can see those are related, hence why they're being multiplied. And we have a bunch of other parameters in the model. All right, so the alpha A, was it a uh, psi, I think? I don't know what the hell that thing actually is. I feel kind of bad not knowing what it is now. All right, all of these things, lambda, phi, they're all independent of race, time, and state, hence there are no race, time, or state subscripts, right? If you look at alpha, it's just alpha. If you look at phi, it's just phi. So those are like exogenous parameters that are determined outside of the system. Now, there's a law of motion of human capital accumulation, right? So this is human capital for the next period. It follows this particular process. Now, this looks like a lot, right? Kind of is, kind of isn't, right? Well, there's A, Hmm, okay, that looks kind of familiar. There's the current amount of human capital. There's future, huh, okay, yeah. So this is actually a similar production function to what we've got, like with just, you know, the A times K to the alpha times, you know, H to the one minus alpha or something. It's a slightly larger, more convoluted, more complicated way of going about it, but it is still pretty similar. Now, so there's an H with a bar, and there's an H without a bar, okay? What's going on with that stuff? Well, if you look at that row, right? So that row is sort of like the, like the alpha or the one minus alpha in that production function that we've seen, right? If you look at that, right? Well, the first row doesn't have an R or an I subscript, the second one, right? That one minus row does have that, right? So what's going on with this? Well, Basically, what we're looking at here is we're looking at like sort of like an average of human capital, right? Sort of like a baseline level of human capital everyone's assumed to have. And then there can be additional human capital on top of that. And we'll talk about what tau is in a little bit. So human capital accumulates based on exogenous human capital shocks, A, right? Technology shocks. The unobserved frontier human capital for parents Right? So like I was saying, sort of like that baseline human capital that we're thinking about. The share of life expectancy for parents spent in school, tau. And so this HIRT, 
and the law of motion implies that the parent's human capital will affect their children's human capital, right? So when I was talking about like the spillovers, right, the intergenerational spillovers, well, they would, they would be generated, they would accumulate within this particular equation here. Now, I haven't gotten to the budget constraint yet, right? We talked about um, the objective function, we looked at a particular law of motion, but there is a budget constraint for the parents, right? Because the parents are the ones that are doing the choosing every single period. Now, if they're going to be the ones doing the choosing, they want to maximize their utility, and they got to do it subject to a budget constraint. It's given by this, right? It's right going like, oh, God, what the hell is all this stuff? Well, P is the price of consumption. Theta is the fixed proportion of child rearing time that's required per kid. This R is the real unit price of living space. Excuse me. And this kappa IRT, tau IRT, is the total time cost of schooling. Now, we're interested in two key parameters here. The first one we're interested in is this, I'll just call it kappa tau, is the total cost of schooling. Now, kappa is the marginal cost of schooling, right? So the marginal cost of schooling multiplied by the total number of expected years spent in schooling will give us, well, the total cost of schooling. Well, okay, it's not the total expected years. It's the share of the expected lifespan devoted to schooling. Right, so it's the total number of years divided by their life expectancy. So we can get data on the lifespan or the expected time devoted to schooling and what we do is we just use a life expectancy of 80 years across time and states. So whatever, however many years of schooling this child gets, the expected like the share of the expected lifespan is that number of years of schooling divided by 80 for every single state every single year. Now, basically, this kappa term tells us sort of like a, like an efficiency of teaching time. So in order to explain how it's generated within the model and with the data, I'm just going to drop the I and R subscripts because, well, we can just say, hey, guess what? They're still there. We're just sort of ignoring them, right? Now let's let this capital E be the total expenditures on schooling of the next generation, right? So the total expenditures that this generation spends on schooling their kids. Now it's going to be expressed by this. Well, total income, this HT times NT, right? Think of it as like the quality of work HT, human capital, multiplied by the number of labor hours. All right, that's going to give us total income. The number of children's, or yeah, children's, geez, I'm not speaking well at all right now. The number of children per adult is X. Now, if we divide by X, we can get expenditures per student as this, expenditures per pupil. Okay, now if we divide by total income, <clears throat> we're gonna get the share of output spent on education per student. All right, so if you look at expenditures per pupil and divide expenditures per pupil by the output, well, that's just the share of expenditures per pupil as a share of output. That's gonna be SE sub T is equal to capital, right? So what this is telling us is that in equilibrium here, the share of output spent on education per student is going to be equal to the total time cost of schooling per student. Okay, that kind of makes sense, right? So SE is a measure of the total time cost of schooling that a family will face when they're deciding how much education, how much human capital accumulation do they want to allocate to their children. If we divide by the model's predicted length of time in school, cap, or tau, we can identify kappa. All right, so the share of education expenditures as a fraction of output per student divided by the predicted length of time spent in school, we get this efficiency of teaching time, kappa. So it provides a measure of the efficiency of schooling that parents face when making educational decisions for their children. All right, so it's actually more of a, you can think of it more as like a measure of inefficiency of schooling. Because as it goes up, right, schooling becomes more costly. Right? The marginal cost of schooling goes up. Therefore, we would expect the kappa for African-American families to be much higher 
than kappa for white families, right? Because if it's more costly, right, on the margin, it will be more costly for an African-American family during this time period between 1890 and 1960 to send their child to school than it would be for white families to send their child to school. Why? Well, because they're not really getting the exact same amount of resources, right? The funding per pupil is much less. The quality of instruction materials, half the time, were just hand-me-downs from a lot of the white schools. So, you know, they would get textbooks that, I don't know if you remember being in, like, elementary or middle school, even high school, people did this, where they would get, like, like that number two pencil, and they would kind of, like, just put it, like, into the book and then just, like, rub their hands together with the pencil inside and, like, kind of twist the pencil, like, through the book. Well, yeah, that would happen, and half the time these textbooks, you couldn't read them. There was material missing. Pages were out. You know, a good chunk of each page was just kind of missing as kids were driving pencils through them, and it, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. So if, you know, those are the conditions that you face, well, it's going to be a little bit more costly for you to go to school, right? It's not just like a it's not just like, okay, well, you know, I've got to pay, you know, $5,000 a year to send my kid to school. It's a little bit more than that, right? Because there's like an opportunity cost that we face as well. And that's what CAP is getting. So what we see is that African-American parents would choose less schooling for their children than the whites would. Basically, they put their kids to work earlier because if that opportunity cost of schooling is higher, right, you're going to put your kids to work earlier. Why are you going to keep them going to school? If, you know, they graduate, get a high school degree, doesn't really help them very much, right? If they're going to get the same job with a high school degree that they would get without a high school education, why would you get a high school education, right? What's the point? So that's kind of what happens, at least as far as what this model says. And then it's sort of incumbent upon us to go, well, can we see if this is observed within the data? Do the data match what the model predicts? So if African Americans are choosing less schooling for their kids, right, there's less human capital accumulation, right, so there's less efficient spillover of human capital between generations. So what I mean by that is if with the African American families, if they don't have as much education as the whites do in the United States, well, they don't have as much human capital. So as their kids go to school, Right? This human capital spillover that would be observed isn't as efficient. Right? Think about long division. Right? If you don't go to school and you don't, you know, okay, well, you probably had more than like a fourth or fifth grade education. But if, you know, whatever it is that you are learning, if the parents didn't make it that far, well, they're not going to be able to help you with it. Right? So there's not going to be as much human capital spillover intergenerationally speaking, for African Americans than there would be for white Americans. So it can actually lead to, like, persistence in this stuff over generations. It's not just like, oh, we'll fix it, you know, fix it now, and multiple generations later, everything's good. Like, you know, the next generation, everything's fine. No, it doesn't work that way. It takes a very long time for things to equalize. So let's talk about how we generate the data. Because I talked here about how we generated this stuff within the model, right? So this is really just playing with the parental budget constraint. But we want to actually be able to get a figure that's somewhat similar using real-world data. How do we do that? Well, fortunately, most of those variables that we had can be observed in the real world, right? So education, there's a share of output spent on education per student by race can be identified or computed is probably a better way to put it, by this equation right here. <clears throat> what is this? Well, total education expenditures by state, by race, by year. So that IRT basically just means by state, I, by race, R, time T. Total education expenditures divided by the student population. All right, well, that is a measure of per-pupil expenditures, right? Total amount being spent on education divided by how many kids are enrolled. <clears throat> but what we have that being multiplied by is the population over five not enrolled in school divided by total income. Right? So this is equal to capital. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we have the per pupil expenditures from state archival data and also a book uh, called Race and Schooling in the South that was published in 1990. I sort of got these measures from both 
sources. Um, the state archival data was definitely the harder one to get. Uh, it was a real nightmare trying to get some of that data. Um, but, you know, now I have it. And it's kind of cool. So we got per pupil expenditure. So that part is kind of taken care of. Now, this is decadal data between 1890 and 1960. So it's 1890, 1900, 1910, etc. I used seven st or 17 states in the analysis. These were all states with available data that had segregation in schools over the entire sample period. The population and labor force data span 1890 to 1960 from the Integrated Public Use Microdata Series, or IPOMS. Right, that's where you can get like basically census data. Uh, the school enrollment data comes from Tamura, Mulholland, and Beyer and their 2007 paper. And unfortunately, <clears throat> when we were looking at the population labor force data stuff, right, from IPOMS, well, we could get earnings data, but sadly, earnings data were only available from 1940 to 1960, so we kind of had to do some stuff to construct a measure of earnings between 1890 and 1930. So if we put everything in nominal terms, we get nominal earnings, right, where we separate things by occupations held by households. Um, we use workers between the age of 25 and 64 who work 35 hours a week and 35 weeks a year, at least. They could work more, but they can't work less. Now, we use a figure of real output per worker given by another paper written by Dr. Tamura, um, expressed in $2,000. We assume that workers get 66% of output. Why do we do that? Well, basically what we're doing is we are assuming that just based on what we've seen in the data, right, when we think about the solo model, right, where I explain that the alpha and the one minus alpha, right, if it's capital K to the power of alpha times labor L to the power of one minus alpha, right, we assume alpha is roughly one third because we assume that of this output, right, the output that's being generated, um, if alpha is one third, then laborers are, get, or laborers are getting two thirds of the output. So we multiply output per worker by 0.66. And then we have to convert output per worker to nominal for this earnings imputation. I'm gonna sort of skip through the earnings stuff. Basically what we did was we used that output per worker figure and we were able to sort of develop like a ratio and push this back as far as we could all the way back to 1890. And that gives us a measure of average earnings for white and black workers between 1890 and 1930, which then allows us to go back and construct kappa and kappa tau. So we also had to generate a measure of the population that was aged five and above, not enrolled in school. So I had to basically just take the population shares, like, you know, five to 13, 14 to 17, so on and so forth, and then multiply them by one minus their enrollment rates, sum them together, and that would give me a figure for the population that's aged five and above, not enrolled in school, right? So now I've generated kappa and I've generated kappa tau. Well, now it's time to test everything. See, how does this actually compare with the model? Well, we run a multi-dimensional panel regression, linear regression, best way to put it. It's just a linear regression with a bunch of different observations per time period over multiple time periods. And it gives me this right here, right? Well, I've got the everything in natural log form for a number of reasons. They're just going to sort of go, okay, cool. It's natural logs. That's that. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But what we have here, right, the natural log of kappa tau for the data, right, being equal to this constant C plus beta, the estimated coefficient for the relationship between the log of the model kappa tau and the log of the data kappa tau plus this gamma i, which is fixed effects, basically indicating is this, what state is this in? If it's in, say, Alabama, okay, that observation gets a one, all the other observations get a zero. If it's Georgia, well, that observation gets a one, all other states get zero. And we have a bunch of those, and those will, those are state fixed effects. They're fixed effects identifying what state we're in. And then we have this epsilon IRT, which is like an error term. It's a residual. It's a difference between what's being modeled and what's being observed. Right, that's for capital. That's for the total time cost of schooling. Well, let's think about the marginal cost of schooling. Well, we do the exact same thing. It's just now it's kappa instead of capital. Now we also use a uh, specification where we include fixed effects for race. Basically, is the household that we're looking at, or like the sort of like the aggregate representative household, is that of is that a white 
household or is it a black household? Because we want to see is not just does the model Kappa Tau and Kappa, not just do those explain the variation and what we observe in the data, but also is it the case where the marginal and total cost of schooling for African Americans is much higher than what it is for white Americans? So we include a specification where we actually allow them to sort of be separated, so to speak, right? We can indicate, okay, is this a white household or a black household? So in this case, right, where I've got an indicator for race, it's basically if the it's black, right, if the household is black, then it is equal to one, it's zero if it's white. So that will allow me to separate these different costs in the estimation. Now I also include time and state fixed effects combined, right? So it's a fixed effect for, you know, okay, we have the state, but it's also one for time each year, right? I also have race and time fixed effects. So same idea, just, you know, we include race and then time and separate everything out. So we're gonna have four different specifications that we're looking at for each of the parameters we're interested in, kappa tau and kappa. So we're gonna start with kappa tau. All right, what do we get here? Well, basically, here, right, so this first row, right, what we're interested in is this number up top, right, 0.948, okay. So we're, it's really asking, okay, you know, kind of like how correlated are these things, right? So we want this thing to be as close to one as possible, right? The closer it is to one, the better the model is describing variation in what we see in the data. So here, it's basically 95%. That's kind of cool, right? Now, if we look at model two, where we include race, right? This is kind of the, the more important one, right? Well, about 0.9, that's still really good if you think about it. Um, let's look at the race. Okay, well, remember I said it would be one if it was a black household, zero if it's a white household. Well, that implies then that, well, you multiply anything by zero, it's just zero, so the only difference would be seen is if the household is black. So this tells me black households faced higher total costs of schooling over this sample period than white households did, right, because this number is positive. Now, these asterisks here tell me that it's statistically significant, right? Is this, basically, is this a reliable result? And the answer to this would be yes. So it's reliable and it's positive, which means, yeah, the, there were, it was more costly for black families to send their children to school than it was for white families. Now, it's Model 3, state and time fixed effects. Just kind of blow past that, not too worried about it. Time and race fixed effects. Okay, well, yeah, again, we can see that it's still more costly to attend school for black families than it is for white families. That's, I mean, it's sad, but it's definitely in line with what the model suggests and also to sort of what common sense would tell us, right? We just sort of assume reading a history book, okay, it's probably more costly, but now what we get to do is we actually can sort of put like a dollar value on racism. We can put like a dollar value on Jim Crow and segregation. So that was for the total cost. Let's look at the marginal cost. Okay, well, again, we look at, say, that model six column. It's positive. It's not statistically significant, but it's still positive. So, okay, we can kind of run with that. Um, let's look at model eight, that column. All right, if we look at the race coefficient, well, yeah, it's uh, it's positive and statistically significant. That's pretty um, pretty damning evidence, right? This is uh, basically suggesting that yes, blacks did in fact face a higher opportunity cost of schooling relative to their white cohort. That's really messed up, right? So okay, separate, definitely not equal. Right, because if it was equal, there wouldn't be any statistically significant difference between white and black students in terms of the costs that they face in accessing education. But here, well, that's not exactly the case. All right, for capital, total time cost, yep, positive, statistically significant. Marginal cost, hmm, okay, statistically significant in one of them, positive still in both. Yeah, that's that's not particularly good. So. Here, the specifications with state and race fixed effects have estimated coefficients close to one. 
these estimated coefficients change substantially when we add time fixed effects in there, which means basically time's playing a more important role than what we initially considered in terms of this variation in schooling choices, which makes sense, right? The choices that a family would make in 1890 are probably not the same as what a family would make in 1950. So yeah, they're not really a surprise there, right? The dummy variables for race are positive, which tells me the total and marginal cost of schooling for African-American students is much higher than it is for white, it's consistent with the model's predictions, consistent really with what everybody sort of considered over all this time. Anyways, it's just, yeah, now we can, we can quantify it better, right? We have a, a better understanding as to what that dollar value of racism is. So we want to do some robustness checks. What do I mean by that? Well, I ran that one specification, and that could just be dumb luck, right? It could be that no other specification worked, but that was the one that did, so I kept that, and I threw everything else away. If we change some things a little bit, right, we can see that the specification, right, the, these estimates are robust to changes in the specification. So instead of doing everything in the natural log, I can do everything just in levels, right? So here we have it levels. Basically, everything else is pretty much the same. It's just I don't do natural log transformations here. So here, what we get, okay, the, wow, yep, the total cost of schooling is much higher for blacks than it is for whites still. All right, we still get statistically significant estimates in two of the four models for kappa tau. Okay, let's look at kappa. All right, yep positive and statistically significant in two of the four, negative and significant in one of them, and then not significant in the other for kappa, for the marginal cost of schooling, right? So again, this is still some additional evidence being provided that we, the model is, the data, the model explains the data rather well, All right? Let's look at race. Okay, what's going on with race here? Well, again, positive, so the, the difference between the marginal cost of schooling faced by blacks is much higher than what it is for whites. Right? The difference between the two, well, blacks face more cost, a higher cost of schooling. So, okay, it's robust. Cool. Now, both kappa tau and kappa depend on parental income and current expenditures per pupil. So if parents are earning less and children are receiving fewer resources in the classroom, Parents will forego additional education for their kids, put them to work sooner, right? They're not parents aren't making as much money. Kids aren't getting a value like a valuable quality education, and parents aren't making that much. They're gonna need help bringing money in. So what do they do? Put their kids to work, right? There's really no point in keeping them in school if they're not getting anything out of school. So you'll see less human capital accumulation for African American families in this case. So this persistent systemic racial discrimination when it comes to schooling access generates, excuse me, lasting differentials in human capital accumulation, right? This isn't just going to be that one generation. It's going to be multiple generations. Parent, parental human capital is low, even despite the institutional changes, right? So Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, basically abolishes segregation, Jim Crow stuff. Um, there's an institutional change, but... If the parental human capital is low, it's not like that institutional change just makes parental human capital just, boom, you know, equal across races. That doesn't happen, right? It's going to take time across these generations for there to be like sort of a, like a catching up, like a, a convergence between the human capital accumulation for whites and blacks. So there's still going to be less schooling for black children than there will be for whites, because, yeah, desegregation is not going to equalize educational attainment immediately. It's going to take a long time for this to get rectified, for this to get fixed. And we can see this. If we look at graduation rates between 1972 and 2012, well, the purple line here is the white graduation rate. The red line would be African-American graduation rates. Now, we can see, right, in 1972, right, this first observation right, there's a massive gap here, right, almost what, 15% difference, yeah, it's huge, 
But as both of them are trending upwards, right? The 90% threshold was crossed, I believe, in like 1992, 1993 for white Americans, right? That wasn't crossed until after 2000 for African Americans, right? It wasn't consistently crossed and maintained until about 2006. That's really not good. But if we look, the, the thing that is interesting here and the thing that is good about this, okay, both of them are trending up. Right now, what we're seeing here is sort of a catching up growth effect, right? If we were to sort of smooth this out, we would see here, right, there's a much faster rate of acceleration, much faster rate of growth that we're seeing earlier on. And then it, as it begins to converge to the white graduation rate, the growth kind of slows down a little bit, right? This is basically, we can think of it as, okay, well, the white Americans were getting higher quality resources, Right, their families, the, the parents, right? Because this is 1972. Well, okay, the desegregation occurred in 1965, but if we consider the intergenerational spillovers, right, the children around here are still being raised by parents that grew up in segregation, Jim Crow. Right. So let's look at this. Well, if we consider that that's the case, there's more efficient human capital accumulation, more efficient human capital spillovers between generations, we can sort of consider this as like the cutting edge growth, right? So when you think about cutting edge growth, right, countries, when we're looking at it like in a country specific context, I had said that countries that are on the leading edge of the research, right, on the leading edge of R&D, leading edge of innovation, all that stuff, tend to grow pretty slowly, right? You'll see like two or 3% growth rate per year. Right? But countries that are a little late to the party, they're going to grow really fast at the beginning, but as they get more and more like equal to the innovation, the, the growth, the, the technological advancements and all that, as the countries that are experiencing cutting-edge growth, their growth rates are going to slow down. Well, we can see that here, not in a like country context, but in a racial context. Right Here, right these children, even though they are not, right, especially like around here, these children were not going to school during Jim Crow and segregation. But there's still a massive uptick, right, in the growth rate, right? The growth rate is much higher here. It's pretty, I mean, that's pretty rapid growth if you look at it. Why? Well, one, the institutional barrier was removed. So that equalizes the access to schooling, the problem, though, would be the human capital spillovers, right? During this time, it's not just like, okay, well, yeah, uh, cool, everything's equal. White kids and black kids can go to the same school. That's fine. Um, everything's going to be great. I, I, I doubt public perception is going to change that quickly. So even though that barrier was removed, it's going to take time for that human capital to accumulate within these families where there can be a more efficient spillover of human capital from the parent to the child. So you're seeing some catching up growth, right? And there will be convergence rather soon in the white and black high school graduation rates, which is a wonderful thing. But the fact that there was even a difference in the first place is kind of a stain on American history, if you really want to think about it. It's just, it's, it's disgusting to think about that there is this major gap in educational attainment solely because of the fact that, well, yeah, the government's like, oh, guess what? White kids and black kids can't go to the same schools. Like, that, that's just, it's disgusting. I don't get it. It's dumb. Anyways, to conclude, I developed a data set providing expenditures per pupil at the state level between 1890 and 1960. This was used to develop measures of the marginal and total cost of schooling to test these key educational efficiency parameters embedded within the model. The results are statistically significant and they're robust to changes in the specification. It means basically the results are good. Now we can see there's convergence in human capital across races that's rather slow and any sort of policy implications regarding growth should address that. Blacks faced much higher cost of schooling than whites did during the sample period 1890 to 1960 which can explain the slow convergence between white and black students that has been observed in the time series.
So this is one particular case where we can use a human capital accumulation model to answer rather interesting and rather relevant questions regarding the economy in the real world. So we, if there's a question that we have, right, we would develop some kind of a theoretical model, use that model to provide like predictions on the way things are supposed to go. And then we would go out, we would collect data, and we would do all sorts of empirical tests with the data to see if the data match the model, right? If the model explains the data well, then it's a good model, right? In this case, we can see that it was, in fact, a very good model, right? Because the data generated within the model explained variation in the data that was observed in real life quite well. They were very highly correlated with each other. That's very good. Um, the sad thing, though, is it confirms some rather uh, depressing results from the theoretical model, but it allows us to understand, okay, um, hmm, let's see, uh, legal racial segregation. Yeah, you can't effing do that, and it doesn't work out well if you try. So we can see that. We can confirm that this, these racist policies were absolutely terrible, right, that generated major differentials in human capital attainment over time, even generations later. Um, but at the same time, while we do that, we also can see we can we're, we're getting closer to being able to put like a dollar value, like a price on racism and Jim Crow. Like how bad was this? Well, we can find differences in, you know, say earnings over time, human capital attainment over time. This is really just the first step in a number of of other studies that will be coming addressing similar questions just in different ways, which just get us closer to being able to put this dollar value on racism in the United States. So um, I hope this wasn't too depressing of a situation to end the growth and development section of the course on. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed watching this. Um, I very much enjoyed making this video as well as just doing this research in general. I think it's particularly interesting to see um, how some of these differences can be explained and what, you know, the driving forces are. And sadly, the driving forces are just, well, very, very sad. Um, but we will wrap up growth and development stuff. The next section is business cycles. We will finish the course with business cycles. Um, business cycles will have a somewhat less depressing outlook. Um, if we weren't you know, being marred by this pandemic right now, I would have a slightly better outlook at the end of that course. But we will now be learning about models that can be used to answer questions about business cycle fluctuations. Like, okay, we're in a recession. What are the best policies that can get us out of a recession? Or we're not in a recession. What are the sources of shocks that could throw us into a recession? So those are sorts of those are the sort of questions that we'll be asking ourselves. We're going to look at a really two different classes of business cycle models. There's the real business cycle model, which is looking at like medium to long run-ish fluctuations, and then the new Keynesian model, which looks more at like short to medium run business cycle fluctuations. Both are very important. Both are very useful. They're just important and useful in different contexts. So that will be the next uh, step in the course. I hope you enjoyed the growth and development section, and uh, I look forward to teaching business cycles and uh, having you guys all around for that too. So thanks for watching.